What's up and welcome to the First Take Podcast, where every now and then some of our staff and friends will get together to talk about different things going on in our world. Today, the discussion is about how Christianity is the only true religion. Whether you're watching or listening, you're going to be glad you tuned in to this episode. Here we go. I've listened to podcasts, like even with the, with a stinger on the front of it, they still like do a sort of like a, hey, let's get the conversation started type thing to me. Like it doesn't just jump right in. Yeah. Am I wrong or am I crazy? Some do, some don't. There are let's some do that- Let's do some that do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do the some that do. Do the some that do. All right. Hey everyone, and welcome back to First Take. We are so glad to be with you. I'm John. This is my guy, Seth, Brian, and Bo. They're joining us again, where we're gonna talk about a few things today. Only Seth is his guy. That's what's awesome. No, 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 I said my guys, right? No, no, you said my guy, <laughs> which is fine. I get it. Yeah, That's it is cool. what it is. Uh, so we got hard. the old guys on the couch. Right right. We know Seth right is Seth. There. That's right, this is wisdom and Whatever. Stupidity, probably. But, uh, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> no, hey, we took a trip this past week. Are you guys feeling arrested? No. No. We're all it's been rough. Still. Yeah. 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 Uh, a hard adjustment. We went to Atlanta. I, as we were coming back, I started to think about what's the dumbest thing you guys have ever done on an airplane or seen on an airplane? So for me, I can answer this really quickly. It was actually happened on this trip. John is an insane person. <laughs> <laughs> Waving. Spirit fingers at the stewardess. She waved back, though. I will she say that. During there's more to the story. There's more. Yeah. As the lady was coming through, John stopped her and said, <laughs> "That was there you go, ma'am. Would you mind asking the pilot if I can go fly the plane so I can get some little wings?" <laughs> yeah. And so then he makes eye contact during the safety announcement, and it's like, and oh. she waves, and then she comes back with like the refreshment service. And he said, did you ask the pilot? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then she proceeded to go on for 20 minutes about how they really needed me. <laughs> and that I would make a great pilot and that I should apply. Sad. She was dead serious. Yeah, was serious. She also said she had just started the job. <laughs> yes, yeah, so she, yeah. maybe she doesn't know as well she as others. She, yeah, she wasn't as jaded as, as some get <laughs> dealing with people like John. But she anyway. said, she did say, uh, yeah, your age would automatically qualify you because we have babies flying the plane right now. <laughs> and I didn't know what she meant until I saw them at the end. And the dude that was flying the plane literally looked like he was 15 years old. He went from flight simulator. Basically, yeah, yeah. Yeah. walked out of his mom's bed, uh, basement yeah. and straight to his job. But anyway, he had just uh, gotten his junior wings. <laughs> yes. Is there anything else we need to talk about the trip? Should we should we at least bring up Seth Cooley's golf swing? It was <laughs> bad. Is that it, baseball swing does not transfer? I will say that it was it was pretty rough. Did you get any in the air? Define, Define in the air. air. <laughs> okay. so it helped. Said, it helped that we were on we were, were on the, the second, second floor. floor so, yeah. so yeah, they launched onto the air and immediately did a nosedive to the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Something that I observed is that you have a career in lumberjacking. Oh yeah, he, yeah, 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 he was chopping it. down on it. I think I'm gonna just take the golf club to John's truck. <laughs> that might be a good start yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I also want to take this time to air a grievance about the trip. To what? To air out a grievance. Uh, uh-huh. You can't put eight grown men in two <laughs> hotel rooms. No. Brian. That's my bad. <laughs> that, that, that is your bad. Yeah. But it ended up working out because Bill is a vet. Bill was pulling vet moves. Bill Saxby. He works here with us too. He was pulling veteran moves the entire trip. He was, yeah. Booked his own room without telling anyone. So we were able to kind of move around and it wasn't as bad. I was on an air mattress because I'm also somewhat of a vet. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I learned. So, uh, yeah, so that was pretty funny. Well, look, today uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the sermon from this past weekend mm-hmm. where we talked about, you know, how can we be confident that Christianity is the, the one true religion? So, Brian, before we really get into it, some of the questions that we are maybe thinking about. Give us a little bit of a, you know, a short synopsis of kind of what you talked about, some of the main ideas from the sermon. Yeah, so the main idea is not all religions can be true together because they all have contrasting claims, specifically around the person of Jesus. That right. When you come to the person of Jesus, he's the, the hinge point of what do you say about him? And that's where a lot of the differences come in. So the, since they all can't be true they all could be wrong, but they can't all be true at the same time. Right. So you got to figure out, 
come to the grips with, okay, if they can't all be true, you know, what do they all say? And then which one best aligns with the reality? And uh, so, and, I, and so the main idea then is, of course, was that Jesus himself taught this. Jesus was the most <clears throat> inclusive, exclusive savior of the world. So he's inclusive, meaning everybody's got an invitation. We right. saw this at the woman at the well, John 4. Everybody's got the same invitation. Everybody gets called out for their sin and their stuff. And everybody's offered access to God through repentance and forgiveness through what Jesus offers to us. So he is exclusive. You come to God only by me, but that invitation is inclusive, inclusive to everyone who's ever existed. Yeah, that was actually a line that really stuck out to me, the inclusive, exclusive line. Mm -hmm. uh, really good. And so, I mean, you know, it'd be easy for us to say, oh, well, that's it. Let's let's move on with life. Yeah. But uh, there are people out there, a lot of people who disagree with your take. They disagree with what you would have said. And so I want us to kind of speak to some of them and, and maybe uh, talk through some of their objections to that line of thinking. And, and one of the main lines of thinking, I don't know, if Seth, you've ever heard this. One of the main lines of thinking that I've heard is the argument that says, you know, whether it be Islam or Judaism or Christianity or whatever, don't we all, don't all religions mm -hmm. kind of point to the same God? And so how would we respond? Uh, and anybody can take this question as we go. Like, how do we respond to someone who would say that, that all of them, no, no matter what they are, they all point to the same God. What, what's the big deal here? So, so just, just to add to the question a little bit, bit I, I've, I've heard, heard the other side of it too, where it's not necessarily that they all point to the same God, but like, how can I be 100% sure yeah. that I'm right and they're wrong? Yeah. And I think Brian made that. Isn't it arrogant yeah. to feel that way, right? Yeah, yeah. Arrogant. So Judgmental I've had conversations yeah. with people that, you know, it's like, well, I'm pretty sure that I'm right. Like, how can I be 100% sure that I'm right and they're wrong? It yeah. seems yeah. cocky of me. <laughs> so I, I would answer that question by trying to discover something. So uh, where are they coming from in asking this question? I think a lot of people in North America, in our area, uh, would probably, if they were to be honest, say, I'm just confused about Christianity because of Christians. Mm. Yeah. And so <laughs> uh, because, you know, you guys are all over the map on everything. Uh, and so I think if you drill down and find out where that person's go coming from, there is an easier answer. Uh, from my perspective, uh, in fact, the trip, we started talking about the trip. Uh, one of the speakers said, if someone can predict their death yeah. and their resurrection, go with that guy. Yeah, right. And there's, there's a singular person mm -hmm. in all of history who's done that, and that's Jesus. And so... A lot of people, it's not just they've met Christians and they're confused by that, but they're also more self-aware than others and they realize how broken they are. And so the passage from John 4, this is a lady who came with tremendous brokenness mm -hmm. where she was not only broken, she was isolated from society. Mm -hmm. She was not allowed to even consider be, be considered to be a religious person because of her background. And Jesus literally went completely out of his way and met with her yep. at the well. Yeah. And I think that breaks the back, completely breaks the back of I'm not good enough. Yeah. And so again, that problem is an enemy whispering in our ear, but it's also, we have probably been pretty judgmental as Christians. Yeah, yeah that doesn't help anything. And yeah, so, and I think we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that next week with why are Christians so hypocritical? Yeah. So that one, we'll, we'll, we'll tackle that next yeah. week, but you're right at the same time, my thought goes to thinking there's just one true religion that does makes you judgmental and arrogant. It's it can, but the deeper you dive into who Jesus is, that actually does something completely opposite. It makes you humble, makes you grateful, and it puts life in a different perspective. So, you know, I would say, well, you know, if well, Christianity just makes you judgmental and arrogant. It's like, well, no, religious, religion disguises Christianity does that. Jesus actually makes you humble and grateful. Yeah, yeah. And the reality is, is like, you know, people would say if they're on the side of that argument, they would say, well, I'm being more kind because I'm allowing people to kind of believe what they believe and I'm not telling them what they have to believe and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, one of the things that I've always been a little bit confused slash alarmed about is how those others, they ignore they don't necessarily ignore Jesus's life, but they do ignore his crucifixion and resurrection yeah. as a historical event. 
Yep. Right. And so the, I would question one of my questions to, you know, you know, a Muslim would be, why did why do y'all choose to ignore that particular event? I think mm-hmm. the reason for that is because that event changed everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And they don't ignore it. You have to understand. You, you can read the uh, Quran and they don't ignore it. They just say it didn't happen. They say he didn't die. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it literally <laughs> says Jesus did not die. You yeah. know? So I, I don't mean, go ahead. No, that's, that's crazy, crazy to me because, because like we talk, talk about. You know, in crime shows, I watched a documentary. Uh, I don't I think I told you about it, but I watched a documentary on Netflix a couple of days ago about a man who was struggling to find his son's murderer and the police weren't cooperating. And, and he knew who did it. And all he needed was a witness to verify who did it. He knew who, who killed his son. And he just needed to find a witness that was willing to speak on behalf mm-hmm. of the incident. And after he found the witness, it was like... And the dude was convicted and, and put in the prison. And and I just don't know. I don't understand how people ignore the historical documents of 500 witnesses. All it takes is one for us to convict someone of a crime for the rest of their life. But we have evidence of 500 people that can verify the resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. It's not only like the 500, but there was a uh, historian of the day that was employed by the Roman Romans oh, yeah. to mm-hmm. document all this stuff. And he thoroughly documented not not just uh, that time period, but main events of that time period. And he talks about physical manifestations in the earth, you know, like darkness, earthquakes. He talks about all of that in his documentation. His name is Josephus, yep. uh, Flavius Josephus. And it's it's not a book you're going to want to get off the, the, the <laughs> shelf and read. Because you can go read on the internet for free, though. <laughs> yeah, you, you find you can, the stuff. Yeah. It's a little exhausting to read, but yeah, it is sure. exhaustive on purpose. I mean, mm-hmm. he just he's documenting all this history. And so I feel that the, the crucifixion uh, was normative yeah. to their society. Mm-hmm. You know, shortly after that, uh, or actually before, maybe my history is messed up, but a um, guy named Titus crucified 20,000 people mm-hmm. in a short amount of time. And so they w- it was known. Yeah. But the resurrection is what not only sets apart Christ- Christianity, but I believe it is the turning point of all human history. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yep. It the is. date restarted. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. The date what? restarted. We, well, we wouldn't, yeah. I mean, we wouldn't have A.D. if he hadn't ridden, risen from the dead. It would have just been another guy who lived and died, and that's the end of the story. <laughs> right. You know, and that's what's crazy. The resurrection, it's like, why is anybody still talking about a Jewish carpenter that lived in the first century who right. taught in an overlooked in a, town? In an overlooked town from the middle of nowhere, you know, <laughs> uh, he'd be from Jennings if he was from Louisiana. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's so, just a massive conspiracy, yeah, right? right. Yeah. You know, and then, but he was, he's the savior of the world mm-hmm. and he proved it not just in his life and death, but ultimately in his resurrection. Yeah. So the argument is that, you know, everything is the same that we're, we're all pointing to the same God, it breaks down in the person of Jesus. It does. You know, it does. And, I, 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 and, it, and a little bit, and I won't say no. too much else about this, it does, it breaks down in, in the person of God too. I mean, sure, yeah. if you read the understanding of the Quran and the understanding of Islam, Allah is not, not Yahweh. The no, they no, are right. very They're different, separate, yeah. very different. So well, well, think, think about this is like, you know, I, I was reading about this earlier all of human history, man has tried to connect, identify with what they call their God. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, it is a, a vain attempt to try to do yep. that. Our God, the God, actually came down and connected with us. Yeah. I've been thinking a lot about the kindness of God lately, mm-hmm. like in my own life and, and that good. sort of thing. And like how kind is he? That he did that, and to me, that you know, that's what we're talking about, and that's yeah. that's what we're con- we're inviting people to as we talk about this kind of stuff, and yeah, absolutely think about you know absolutely. what is the true religion. That's what we're talking. Mm-hmm. It's not you know come do this 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 and this for this God. This God did so much for us. Yep, you know yeah, that's good. Even the story from John four that Pastor Brian used illustrated, uh, we're just like studying through it. I don't always have these grand scheme things, but I remember it was more than an epiphany. It was. When I was reading that text, John chapter four, verse four, it says, and Jesus had to pass. And we've talked about this, Mm -hmm. you know, guys. So a timeless God subjected himself to time to keep an appointment Mm -hmm. with one of his creations. (laughs) And as a result of that, I believe the first 
modern church age revival took place among mm -hmm. uh, her town, <laughs> in her town, yeah. because she met a man who knew everything about her, mm -hmm. and she experienced that he was the truth, not a truth. Yep. And she just went back to town and told everybody she could. Mm -hmm. And that wouldn't have happened if G if God wouldn't have put on skin and flesh. Mm -hmm. And so just just in that, the incarnation is God saying, I'm going to the very end. Yeah, 100%. That I can, I can go as far as I can possibly go, and that is to become one of you so that you could become, uh, we can have a relationship with one another. Mm -hmm. And so it's gi giant when you think about the implications of God putting on flesh. Yeah. The incarnation is utterly unique among everything. Everything. Islam, Judaism, the New Age stuff, Buddhism, anything else you want to throw in, Hinduism. There, there's nothing like the incarnation in anywhere else, no. which makes, you know, we're unique. Now, you can say we're wrong, and that's fine. <laughs> yeah. But you can't say, oh, you're just like everybody you're else. Like, yeah, exactly. Right. And so, Bo, you kind of brought this up a little while ago with, you know, some of the confusion is because we, even in Christianity, we, we go all these different ways. And so I want us to, uh, one of the things that it was a question that was brought up in one of our small groups um, was, okay, if I'm behind the Christianity being the true religion, but there's so many different options that we call denominations, right? And so like, what do I, <laughs> what do I do with that? How do I know that, you know, First Moss Bluff is the right choice for me? And, and so I want us to talk about you know, why all the different denominations? Let's really, real quickly kind of get into the history of that maybe a little bit, but just a little because that can get boring quickly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also let's let's talk too about how, what are we looking for? If I'm someone looking for a place to plug in or if I'm looking for making sure I'm in the right place, what am I actually looking for in those moments? So the difference between a world religion or religion and a denomination is that religion is based upon who you follow. A denomination is based upon doctrines within that. And so if we were to be honest, the way we have seg segmented Christianity with denominations, there's also that in the Islam, there's also that in yeah, Mormonism, there there's also that in Hinduism. And yeah. so all, all every world religion has denominations. They just don't call it that way. Yeah, yeah. They, they would call it sex or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but whenever you think about like the second part of your question, so what are you looking for in a Christian denomination? Is that what you're yeah, yeah, for getting sure. at? You want to go somewhere where it's not Jesus plus fill in the blank. Yeah. yeah, It's Christ and Christ alone. Jesus said that before the reformers of the 15th century said that. Sure. Yeah. You know, it's me. It's only me. It's no one else. Mm -hmm. um, and then you want to, you know, I have a preference in this. You want to have a place where it's safe to, ha to ask questions. Yeah. And so, you know. A lot of questions get stuffed and put in the corner, and and that doesn't grow people. Yeah. Whenever you're in a, an environment, we call them community or small groups. Whenever you can get in a group and ask real questions, like this question, like you know, it's just a simple question that's asked. Yeah. yeah. But what's the difference between a religion and a denomination? Yeah. Uh, maybe people don't feel the freedom to ask that in some of their places. Yeah. I'm grateful, and this is another portion of God's grace to me in my life that I'm a part of this particular church. Where questions are okay. Yeah, for sure. that's true. And I'd also say you want to find a church that doesn't, I call, there's doctrines are, some are closed-handed, some are open-handed. Yes. Mm. The closed-handed ones are like, okay, these are foundational, identity-shaping things. Uh, we've talked about the main one being Jesus is Lord, <laughs> Jesus is King, Jesus is Savior, Jesus is God in the flesh. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's a couple others, you know, the Bible, um, for us, baptism by immersion is, is that one. But then there's other things over here, and this is where churches and denominations unfortunately get skewed and some bad things happen. So I say you want to find a church that, like, if they make open-handed issues, primary, close-handed issues, you might want to be careful it's a there. Flag there. Yeah, you should be careful there. Yeah, yeah that, so whenever you do that, that would be the equivalent of Jesus plus something. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Sure. In our community, we have a lot of people who grew up Catholic or some other denomination. Mm -hmm. And they come to our church and maybe they, they want to start coming and they, they run into some pressures from their families. Mm -hmm. I know all of us have dealt with people in, the, <laughs> in those situations. What's some advice that you give to people who are going through that on like how to navigate that particular situation? Because that can be really tough. Um, you know, there, there are families that, 
you know, that, that tradition goes way back and they, they can put a lot of pressure on people. So what do y'all, what do y'all say to people who are going through that? Uh, it's tough. I mean, I've had some recent experience with, a, with some, some friends that have gone through that and, and like, it's a, at one point in time and it was like, you pick this or you pick us. Mm. And it, it had That's nothing hard. to do with Jesus. It was it was about um, if if you do this thing, um, you're done with us. And so like that 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 was that was kind of what was at stake. And um, you know I, I go back to um, Jesus having the encounter with um, the guy who wanted to go back and and bury yeah. his, his father and mother. Yeah. That's what uh, I was thinking about too. It's, you know like um, let the dead bury the dead, man. Yeah, it's time to come with me. Yeah. Yeah, and she, she and that's, that's particular scripture. Uh, I think that most interpretations would say that they weren't dead yet; like they were at the end of their age. And so, um, he had the, you know, that was what was put on the table for him. And so, I think walking someone through that with gentleness and and you know, obviously not emphasizing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. it's tough. Yeah, um, but also at the end of the day, like this Jesus thing that we're, we're, we're working through and doing it, it's personal. It's for me, like me personally, like I'm married and, and, and I'm very grateful. And like, by the grace of God, like I was raised up in a family that where, where we all agree on these things. Um, but this Jesus thing is personal to me. It's not, it's not me and my wife. Like I'm responsible for this for me. And so like, I would ask someone like, um, you know, is this personal to you or, or, or how, how personal do you, do you want this thing to be? Because this is the way that Jesus designed this it ex- to be. And it's his expectation of it. Exactly. Right? Like, it's extremely personal. Think yeah. about what we learned somewhat at the conference. You know, we talked about <laughs> yeah. the expectations of Jesus on us as his followers are high. They are. It's not give a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> it's give everything. Yeah. So it's not so, just prayer, prayer, walk down and get baptized. All right, you're good now. No, it's, it's like high, but it's simple though. It is it's not simple. hard. Yeah. Just give up. Just give up. Just, give up. <laughs> just, get, just, just let go. Like it. it yeah. It's it, something it, to be simple and hard at the yeah. same time. <laughs> yeah. I, I think so because yeah. like if you, if you think of other scenarios where you have to, to work to earn things. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's none of that here because of grace. Like it, it's not a, it's not a, a working to, to earn things, like to earn love back, like it's it's there, um, and it's just just give it up and follow it. I don't know. I don't know maybe, that, maybe that's so we've had this experience more complicated in our family, and so so. But I want to, uh, while well, I've had that experience in my family, I want to take your story and say, if you were to say to mom, dad, brother, or us, hey, I'm thinking about stepping out and going another direction, we would have every angst that every other family member would have if, yeah. you know, so, yeah. and I'll illustrate it. And, and we would be, we would, while well, we would be for you, we wouldn't be for the path that you're about to take right. because we don't understand it. We don't identify with mm-hmm. it. And we would have a personal struggle with allowing you to do it. Right. right. So when my dad came to faith in Christ, he was 41. Uh, and his mother this literally, I, I hope everybody can feel this way about their grandparents or their mamas, as we call them. <laughs> uh, she was one of the sweetest people. And I never, that I, I, she passed away when I was 21. I never heard her say an ill word about anyone. Mm-hmm. She had plenty of reason to, but, <laughs> but she never did. With one exception, I overheard through her little house. The living room was separated by a half wall. My dad was in there telling her, Mom, I just came to Christ, hmm. joined in the Baptist church. I'm going to be baptized. I would like for you to come. And my grandmother says, you could have waited until I was dead. Mm. So there, yeah, that's and real. I would tell you, Seth, if it was you, I would tell you, man, I wish you'd have waited till I was dead <laughs> to walk away. So I, there, we would all understand that tension. Yeah. But so the, the starting point for how do you help someone navigate is severe empathy. Yeah. Yeah. Is, you Not got, just for them, but also for but the other side. Yeah. yeah. And so I would say, love your family well mm-hmm. and, and handle their questions best you can. But still, Jesus is not a priority in your life when you come to him. He's the king of your life. Right. And so you're going with him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but still mm-hmm. keep family connections if they're possible. Uh, mm-hmm. 
If not, you got to know that if you go to a church, as we mentioned earlier, there's going to be a community there that's going to fully embrace you, handle mm -hmm. your questions, and help you deal with what would be, become a void in your life. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's important to know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we, we can all say like this is an easy situation, uh -huh. you know, or e any of these questions would be easy, but they're not really no, easy. No, And especially like in a debate culture that we live in, you know, people are just up for an argument, you know, mm -hmm. whether it be in person or online or, or whatever. It seems like everybody's always looking for their next argument, you know, sometimes. Yeah. And so how do you deal, uh, you know, if someone's coming to you and they want to have an argument with you about what the true religion is, what would you say to them? Would you would you engage? Would you would you try to give an argument, or do you automatically point them in a different direction? Because some of your sermon kind of lean towards maybe not engaging a, a little bit. And so, how would y'all say to respond to someone who's doing what the culture does and says, "Hey, let's have a debate on this," you know, that sort of thing? Well, I mean, I would engage in a conversation. You yeah, know, I don't yeah. argue, but I'll I'll talk and yeah. I'll tell you my experience. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you why. I, it, it's not just, you know, I don't believe this just because it's what I was raised in. I wasn't raised in this, right. you know, so um, I wasn't even raised Baptist. I had a guy tell me one time, oh, you're you're Baptist just because you were raised in it. I was like, that ain't true. Like, <laughs> I chose this. As crazy as that sounds, <laughs> I chose it. So, um, yeah, I would, yeah, I would definitely engage in the conversation. I've tried, you know, uh, Jehovah's Witness come knock on my door and they find out who I am. They they get out of there quick, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. So, but I do. I will try to engage. I will keep it a civil conversation. I'm I'm not gonna argue with yeah. someone and fight and that kind of thing. That does nothing. But having a great conversation with somebody where you're listening just as much as you're talking, trying to it's understand. Yeah. That's what's important. Yeah. Is it's it's a conversation. I'm not gonna lecture you. Mm -hmm. I want to hear you. I want to hear what you're saying. And then, you know, when it, the moment is right and God will give you the wisdom when the moment's right, I'll speak. So, where, where are you trying to take that conversation? Oh, I, as a strategy. Me? I want to talk about Jesus. Yeah. The person who you, he is, as I said at the beginning of this, he is the 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 uh, turning point. What mm -hmm. you say, his question that he asked in Matthew 16, and I've started, and I will start every message in the series with it is, who do you say I am? That is the question for life. Who do you say Jesus is? And that's mm -hmm. where I want to take the conversation. Well, I think that that's an important place for us to go next as we kind of wrap up and close is I'd like for us to get a little personal and, and you know, talk with each other about the answer to that question and how that maybe that question has evolved from maybe even before you came to know Christ or as you've matured and grown in your faith over the years, maybe some turning points and how that the answer to that question has evolved. And so uh, I, I just, you know, whoever wants to go first, but like, let's let's talk a little personally about what who Jesus is to us and what that actually has done for us as far as like making our lives better because of who he is to us. Yeah, I believe I'll start. So. I've picked this phrase up later, but life is best and I'm best at life when I follow Jesus. Right. So, uh, but initially it was just, uh, I was desperate 19 year old kid, angry at the world and, and everything that was going on directionless. And when, you know, when the person who, um, explained the gospel to me for the first time, I'd had people invite me to church and I would laugh in their face. Mm -hmm. I'd had people tell me, and they would play their Christian music for me. I remember the first time I heard DC talk. I was like, <laughs> this is the biggest joke in the world. I was like, because I, I, I remember it was, uh, what was the song? Jesus Freak? Yeah. Was yeah. The song? I was yeah. like, this is a complete ripoff of Smells Like Teen Spirit. Yeah. And I was yeah. 17 years old and a huge Nirvana fan. Yeah. Like, it's a complete ripoff. Like, who do you think they fan. are? So, well. You should. You know, <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I was lost, directionless, and then when the person finally explained the gospel, not church, not religion, he explained right. who Jesus was, what Jesus had done, man, I just, my heart was broken and he became, he became my savior. I think over time he became my Lord. And I think now in a place where he's savior, Lord and King, that's why mm -hmm. whenever y'all hear me pray at church, I always say in the name of our savior, Lord, savior and King Jesus, because I think all three he needs to be all three in my life. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I've experienced that over these, gosh, I was 19 when I was saved and 44 now. So 25 years. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, my, my experience is a little bit different. You know, I, I uh, or actually a lot different. I grew up in church, you know, from mm -hmm. the time I was born, uh, saved at a young age, but 
you know, not very serious about it. Probably wasn't discipled that well, you know, some different things, you know, going on like that. And I think Jesus to me early in my life was more of a status thing. It was more of like, Mm. this is just kind of who I am. I go to church and I, I used him to, I wanted people to think I was a certain way. And like, looking back, I was kind of a fraud if I'm being honest, Mm -hmm. like, uh, because I had my Jesus church friends and people that knew me and they knew that particular version of John. Mm -hmm. And then I had this other group of friends that I was out doing, you know, partying and doing all these other things with. And so it was, Jesus was just like this identity, but not in a good way. Mm -hmm. It was, it was a stolen identity almost. Yeah. Um, and and it, it never, and so because of that, some things happened in my early 20s that made me, I felt called to the ministry at, at 17, but in my early 20s, um, some things happened where I ran from that call and was in full rebellion for about 10 years. And, you know, that culminated with me falling into like real bad anxiety, almost probably a little bit, a bit of depression for a couple of months. Hmm. And that experience is what brought me from and in that time of rebellion, I had completely said, I'm, I'm out on this whole thing. I'm done. I don't want any part of church. I don't want any part. You know, I didn't try to grow in my faith. I wasn't, I wasn't interested in that, in that time. Yeah. But that experience brought me to a place of repentance, a place of like real brokenness, maybe that I had, had hardly experienced as a younger person. And so Jesus went from being, you know, something I did as, as, I wanted people to think I was a certain thing to like, Jesus is the restorer of my life at this yeah. point. Like yeah. he has completely restored all of what I come, I jacked up. Like I, <laughs> yeah. I messed up my life for 10 years or more. And Jesus has come in and completely rearranged things. And I'm still messed up. You guys know that I'm, I'm like, I can be an idiot on a plane and ask stupid questions on the flight attendant, <laughs> but he has completely restored my life. And, and you know, I, I've really been thinking a lot about the kindness of God. Like, yeah, he's good. just so kind, man, to do that for me. And to, I, I, I was a prime example of someone he should have gave up on. He didn't. That's right. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's where I'm yeah. at. I think like even more recently for me, the, um, and this is, you know, more towards the, the person of God. Um, but like I was raised in church and was discipled very well by my parents. And so, um, you know, like my dad is probably my best friend currently. Um, but that relationship has changed since I've gotten married and moved out. And so, um, to, ex- to know how wonderful and, um, awesome my earthly father is and then how the, uh, me moving out ha- has created some separation. Obviously, because I got married, moved out and, you know, we, um, we're not spending as much time together and that type of thing has has also allowed me to experience how much more beautiful my relationship is with my heavenly father and like to think like as good as my dad could possibly be and as as much as a pedestal that i put him on um it, it doesn't even come close to um a heavenly father um, yeah. and how that relationship will continue to change and continue to to uh my earthly father you know will continue to change as he gets older as i get older but but the, the heavenly father relationship is not it's not shifting. It's not changing. It, it's rooted. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. I came to faith in Christ whenever I was 12, <clears throat> 12 and a half. At that point, you're counting half years, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm deducting half years. Yeah, but, uh, trying to at least. And so uh, 35 years of life. And what I have experienced is that I came to Jesus. Uh, not as it, I was in bad shape. But I'm more aware of how bad shape I'm, how bad of a shape I'm in now. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. a 12 year old to a 47 year old guy. Uh, but in that moment of coming to him, I experienced exactly what I needed in him. And while I felt unloved, the message that Jesus brought me was, I love you. Mm-hmm. And so a man yeah. pulled a Gideon New Testament out of his front <laughs> overall pocket. <laughs> opened it up to John three sixteen and asked me to read it. I read it. And then he says, now I want you to take that and change it. I want you to put your name in it. Mm-hmm. And so I never forget, I, and I hope I never will, for God so loved Bo. And I stopped and I could not, I couldn't go for, further in yeah. the reading mm-hmm. because I came to that, that truth, I guess, is what I would say from this side of it. Mm-hmm. 
but it changed me in a moment mm-hmm. to realize that uh, God knows me and he loves me. And so, but now, well, in that moment, he not only became my savior, but he became a priority because someone made him become a priority in my life. My pastor partnered with me uh, and held me accountable for reading the Bible, studying it, asking him questions, being in community. And so, uh, and I know that's maybe not the normal experience that people get, yeah. and I'm sorry that it's not the yeah. normal experience. Um, but over time, while he was a priority, over, as Brian mentioned, my relationship with him has grown in trust. I can literally say I trust him even in crazy times. Yeah. Now, I know that I'm going to make that statement today, and I'm going to be challenged in a whole yeah. other way to trust him in the future. But after 35 years, I got no reason not to yeah. trust him. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's evolved to, I remember, fall of last year writing this statement that he's not a priority, he's a king. And to settle for him being a priority in my life means that he's just a placeholder that I can move around. Yeah. And I can't allow him to be that in my life anymore. Mm-hmm. And so he's not a priority that can be moved. He is the king of my life. And so kings sit on thrones. And so uh, now I say that and that may sound pride or whatever, proud or whatever. Uh, I'm not perfect in that execution yeah, right. at all. Yeah. But he's perfect at being a king. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I've also learned over time that while he makes demands, as we talked of us, and and, the, and they're big, um, he has a side of kindness that is extremely patient with us as he draws us, as he grows us. And yeah. so, you know. So it's okay if we're not getting it all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so Romans 8, you got it when I, you, you know the word Romans 8 1. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Yeah. And then you skip down towards the end. It's not a Jesus juke at all, but a good understanding of uh, that God works to the good or for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. And so his purpose is to change me from the inside out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So God is more committed to my changing my purpose on most days than I am. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's just patience. And so I think the big evolution is just, not just the trust, but knowing the point and place that he deserves in my life as king and celebrating the fact that the king has invited me to be his. That's awesome. I think the big idea that, that we want to you know, make sure we know, but as well as everybody who's listening or watching, is that you got to know who Jesus is to you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and as he grows you, you got to know how that grows and what that means. And if you ever get into one of these conversations— yeah, you can talk about some of the facts. You can talk about some of the you know historical things that have happened, and you can l- go into that. But at some point, we need to turn the conversation to Jesus yeah, and what yeah, He's done right. for us, yeah. because that's what's going to change hearts and minds, not facts. It's going to be about the man Jesus and the God Jesus, what He has done for us to change us and make us into the people um, that He wants us to be. And so that's oh, important. Yeah. Can I close with just a little story, yeah. which is an experience years ago living in another town east of here. Um, There was a student who was from Hong Kong at the university, uh, and um, she had a friend named Rebecca. And uh, this girl from Hong Kong was was not a Christian. And so in order for her to serve her God, she had to go to where he was Mm -hmm. and make an offering or whatever. Mm. And so Rebecca was explaining to her uh, one night, and she says, she just stopped the conversation. She says, are you telling me that your God came to you? (laughs) And she says, that's right. Uh-huh. And and he, he came as Jesus. Mm. And so I, I'll never forget that moment. I get the, the free zones <laughs> just telling that story. Uh, but in other cultures, people are confused by the grace that God extends. Yeah. And that's why it's so hard to believe. Yeah, yeah. And so it's a crisis of belief. And so I think if I could encourage anybody in this. It's, it's do more than give Jesus a chance. Mm-hmm. Uh, do more than that. But in doing that, give him a chance to challenge what you think is right mm-hmm. or what, what is normative to you. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to tell you if, you, if I would do that in my life, he wins every time. Yeah, yeah. Well, this has been a good conversation. I appreciate you guys. It's been awesome. 
Uh, we want to thank everyone for listening or watching wherever you are. If you like this type of content, make sure that you hit the subscribe button on whatever uh, you're watching on uh, so that you can follow the first Moss Bluff podcast. We're going to be doing this every week for this series and maybe even beyond that. It's a lot of fun to be able to talk about the things uh, that, that we're talking about. And so we want to thank you for joining us. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Oh, remember next week, I get to find out why y'all are so messed up because we're going to talk about you being a hypocrite. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you. Yeah, no. me. Yeah, I'm pointing back at okay, myself. Okay, yeah, for okay. sure. Yeah. Just, I thought like, you were pointing at him. <laughs> I was looking at him. We were like, bro, you got to get fired. We, we will all, yeah, we will all be like, yeah, I'm in that boat. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, I think I'm sick next Thursday. Yeah, yeah that, that'll, be a, that'll be a real good conversation. So Absolutely. we'll see y'all then. Thank you.